welcome to Victory On Demand. We hope that this service you're about to watch helps you, inspires you, and challenges you in some way that helps you take your next step. We want to connect with you. We know that life is busy and that you may be watching this on a Tuesday afternoon or maybe a Saturday morning or some other day of the week that isn't Sunday. And that's the beauty of On Demand and that God can use any of the other 167 hours of the week to connect us back to Him. But we want to be able to include you as part of our church family and to help you take your next step wherever that may be. Let us know that you're here by clicking on one of the buttons that's popping up on your screen right now. Now, no matter who you are, where you are, or what you're struggling with, our goal is to equip you with a new perspective that you'll hopefully be able to use in order to live life in a better way. And we pray that as you live out God's word, that you would truly experience something more, something better. If you haven't experienced a live Victory service yet, we invite you to visit victorycc.life for more information on when and where you can join us in person or online. We're so glad that you've chosen to be a part of Victory today, and we hope that you enjoy our service. Good morning, Victory. We invite you to stand on your feet for a time of worship and celebration. Let's give adoration to the King of Kings this morning. We're glad that you're here.
from the darkness I called your name into darkness your mercy came you called me out lifted me up how great is your love you bore my weakness you took my shame you buried my burdens in fields of grace you called me out, lifted me up, how great is your love. Sing from the heights. From the heights of heaven, you step down to earth. In a set perfection, you gave your life for us and we are amazed. Yes, we stand.
what a statement, what a declaration that we all can rally around. Not only a powerful melody, but a powerful truth. That this is what we are centered around. This is what our common belief is. That Jesus came, that he died for our sins, and then he rose three days later. This is one of my favorite parts of church that we get to do together. A rhythm of remembering, of celebrating the Lord's Supper. So we're going to do that in just a moment. If you didn't grab it, it's out the doors, right, right back there. But we'll take that together in a moment. But I want to pray, and then we're going to take this together. Let's pray. God, we, we thank you. We thank you for that statement, that declaration, that we're all rallied together, or that we're able to shout and proclaim these words. I, I pray that that would just that would go beneath the surface, that we believe that to our core, because we are weary souls. We have worry, we have doubt, we have things that make us imperfect. But we are pursuing a perfect heavenly father and lord in this moment lord we just want to give you honor and glory to remember back that when you entered time our history our space our mess and you died for our sins lord thank you for that that declaration of love that that display of love the display of just your intentions and your detail and, and father we're so thankful that, that you rose again. Jesus, you rose from the grave, conquering death. And that we too have that promise of eternity if we've put our, our hope and trust in you. So Lord, in this moment, I just pray that we'd be encouraged. Lord, as we're, as we're gathered together, that we would be refined, that we would be encouraged, that we'd be grafted into the family, that we'd have a confidence and boldness in our faith. And as we go out these doors, that we'd be able to make disciples, to go out these doors and to preach the good news through our actions, through our speech. In this moment, Lord, I, I just pray that you would receive honor and glory. Lord, thank you for connecting us back. In Jesus' name. Each year around Easter, uh, we prepare for a special offering to help tackle some of the specific needs that need to be addressed. And so this year, our team found multiple opportunities that really resonate with the heartbeat of victory and create a lasting impact in our community and actually around the world. And so for the next four weeks, if you call Victory Your Church, we wanna encourage you to pray about a one-time sacrificial gift to give during our Easter services on March 31st. Uh, some of these opportunities include, include setting up the next gen to win by providing funding to do what so many of you probably did growing up, DBS and uh, we, Summer Surge, that's what we call it. Uh, we budgeted it for it this year, but so far we haven't been meeting our budget, but we wanna make sure that that takes place. Why? Because Jesus followers are commanded to pass down their faith. So our off, part of our offering will do that, go to part of that. 
Another part is to do something that's close to the heart of Jesus. It's to help feed hungry families both here in our community and around the world. And we do that here through Pack Away Hunger. Uh, we will host an event in October, but just to be prepared to host it, it takes $10,000 to set that up, to do everything necessary, to purchase the food and all of that. So, so we're gonna do that. Another opportunity we're gonna address is uh, one of our global mission partners in the Dominican. Uh, Aaron is leading a trip to the Dominican and you're gonna hear about some of the exciting things that we get to be uh, a part of uh, in July. So there's gonna be more information about that. And finally, we wanna bring joy uh, to our community here in Franklin, Whiteland, Edinburgh, and even up in Indy. Uh, in the past, we've done some pretty awesome things like paid off lunch balances at our schools or help first year teachers. Uh, we partnered with the police by purchasing them bikes and dogs who bark at the bikes. I don't know, but, but we enjoy, uh, we got to join the front line of the EMTs. We bought them some equipment uh, and our plan with this offering is to be positioned to be ready. Be positioned to be ready to respond to some of the needs in our community. Our goal is simply this, that if our church ceased to exist, the community, even the world, would actually miss us. And so we have four weeks uh, to prepare for a one-time sacrificial to you, one-time sacrificial to me gift. Not only that, but, but I, I had a couple uh, come up to me uh, as brand new couple this time. I, I think you probably think it's the same people every time, brand new. And they said, hey, we wanna give $15,000 as a match so that every dollar we give becomes two, up to $15,000. And together, if we can do that, we can make an impact in our community and around the world by providing joy where it might look dark. So that's what we've been preparing for. But in this moment, I just wanna thank all of you who consistently give throughout the year. I'm just telling you, without you, we would cease to be a church. So thank you, thank you, thank you for your sacrificial generosity. It is changing lives forever. Would you pray with me? Father, just thank you so much uh, that, uh, that how you use this church and how you inspire your people to be a part of what you're doing in the world. Father, help us to recenter our hearts and our lives to know that we give because you gave first. And Father, may we leave this place differently because we had an opportunity to meet with the heart of God today. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Jesus commands us to love our neighbors as ourselves. You're probably thinking, easier said than done, right? Who is my neighbor? What did Jesus mean by neighbor anyway? We're well-intentioned in sharing the love of Jesus, but if we're honest, we're not usually sure where to begin. We've tried things that didn't work or that just felt downright awkward. So how do we best share the love of Jesus with those around us? Well, Jesus tells us. Better yet, He shows us by using five simple practices that Jesus demonstrates throughout the Gospels, we can learn how to bless our neighbor. When we bless our neighbor, we love our neighbor. And love like that could change the world again. So how do we love our neighbor? B-L-E-S-S. -S. Are you uh, ever overwhelmed by the need in the world? Like when you turn on the news or scroll through social media, like there's a war in Israel, there's a war in Ukraine, there's a war brewing someplace all the time. Are you ever overwhelmed by all of the, the need that's in the world? And maybe this last week, you spent some time worrying about someone in your family. Maybe you heard some news this last week where someone is struggling and you just don't know how to help them. Someone may be failing out of school and you're not a teacher. It's an upcoming surgery and you're not a surgeon. It's a cancer diagnosis and you don't have a cure. It's a marriage heading towards divorce and you aren't a counselor. It's an addiction that you can't even seem to pray away. And you look around the world and maybe you look around your family and the people that you love. And I'm just saying, are you ever overwhelmed by all of that need in, in the world. And I, I don't know about you, but when I look around, the need seems so great. The, the hurt and the pain seems so much. And, and my experience and my training and what I might have to offer truly just seems so small. And I feel so ill-equipped to handle all of the need in the world. And, and many ministers feel the same way I do. In fact, 
If you ever get a group of us together and we start talking to each other about how different things that overwhelm us, you will probably hear a phrase that will break the silence or break the, the hurt or the pain. And someone will try to say something funny by saying a little something like this. I bet they didn't teach you that in Bible college. Right? I bet they didn't teach you that. It's like, there was, there was no class for that. I bet they didn't teach you that in Bible college. And the reality is I never had a class on how to pr uh, properly care for an addicted brother. There's no class on how to heal a relationship where the father and son are fighting in the streets. I, and I never had a lecture about how to heal every marriage that was shaken with infidelity. Did, didn't miss that lecture. They didn't give me the words that when I was at the house of one of our college students, I had to tell her parents that she died in a car wreck on the way to school. Never had a class on that. And they, they never prepared me for the perfect words to say to the grandfather who accidentally backed up his truck over his four-year-old son's head. Now, they never say, hey, one time you're going to be in a parking lot in a hospital and the son's going to be screaming death threats at his dad. Uh, they, they never gave you a class for that. There, there are no magical words to solve everything. They just didn't teach me that in Bible college. Now, I do know God knows and God sees and God cares for the people that I have the opportunity to minister to, but too often I am overwhelmed by, by the need in the world. And if you're here today, and maybe you're even on the edges of faith, I know that you care about the people in your world too. So today we're going to look at a text where Jesus shares what to do when we are overwhelmed by the need in the world. And this is going to be how we are to respond if we're Jesus followers. Now, if you don't call yourself a Jesus follower, the good news is for you, you can just sit back and listen. You don't have to do any of it. But if you call yourself a Jesus follower, we don't have an option. Now, these are commands from Jesus to our lives. In fact, I ask this question all of the time. So let me just ask it one more time. Is what do Jesus followers do? What do Jesus followers do? They, they simply, they follow Jesus, right? They follow Jesus. And so what Jesus has to say to us is gonna be so relevant and so insightful and so life-changing. Get this, if everybody in your family would take this one teaching from Jesus seriously for just a month, it would change the chemistry in your family. I, I, you don't even have to follow Jesus. If everybody in, in, in our town would just take this one teaching from Jesus seriously for just one month, it would change our whole community. I'm telling you, it is that powerful. If you have your Bible or mobile device, we're gonna be in Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10 is where we're going. I'm gonna be reading out of the New Living Translation. And what, I'm gonna take you to the second year of Jesus's ministry around 27 AD. And Jesus is gonna share a parable in the midst of this, which is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. It's a made up story by Jesus. And meaning Jesus is gonna teach his followers, get this, what it would look like to look like their father in heaven. And he's gonna give his followers an assignment to bring heaven to earth. And I was, so we get to see, before we do that, I'm gonna give you the setup to the text. So Jesus is teaching in front of a Jewish lawyer who would have been schooled in the religious laws of the Old Testament. So he would have known all and memorized all the stuff you fall asleep when you read Leviticus, Deuteronomy. He would have memorized it. So he knows all of God's laws for all of his people. And he knows how to, know how to, how to keep in good standing with God. And in the middle of Jesus's teaching, as Jewish lawyer raises his hand and asks Jesus a question to try to stump Jesus. Verse 25, it says this. One day, an expert of the religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question. Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? In other words, Jesus, how do I get to heaven? How do I avoid hell? Like, Jesus, what, what religious rules do I have to keep in order to earn heaven? Now, to point out, uh, this religious leader believed a lie, right? That he, that he, he believed that he could actually do something to earn eternal life. Look at it again. What, what should I do? What can I do can I, to earn, etern, inherit eternal life? And even though he asked a, a wrong question, Jesus meets him where he is. And he says, what does the law of Moses say? Uh, you know the Old Testament. What's the law of Moses say? How do you read it? The man answered, you must, and he's quoting scripture, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and all of your mind. Now, that was a common response in Jesus's day. 
In fact, this religious leader is quoting the Old Testament law found in Deuteronomy 6, 5. That's that law right there. And now what the interesting part is simply this. We find two different accounts of the interactions with Jesus in Matthew 22 and in Mark 12. Right, so, so Jesus is having different interactions with the religious leaders, and Jesus has already taught on this. In fact, Matthew, who was an eyewitness, records the last time Jesus has an argument over this, and he silences the religious leaders of the day. So, so they, they had tried to trick Jesus before. In fact, in, in Mark chapter 12, they're debating Jesus, and they're trying to undermine his credibility. In fact, they ask him this question, of all of the commands, which is the most important? So Jesus, hey, which rules do I really need to, to keep so that I can get to heaven? And here's what, what Jesus said. He, he added to Deuteronomy. He said, well, it starts off with Deuteronomy. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then he adds to it. Before the religious leaders could stop him and say, hey, time out, Jesus. Jesus says these words. And the second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. And I don't know how you envision this, but I imagine Jesus staring them down. You know, he kind of pauses and he says, and no other commandment is greater than these, right? And so Peter, Peter who was there, told Mark uh, what the religious, and the religious leaders walked away stunned because of what Jesus said in that moment. He linked, get this, they thought that the, their love for God was all about vertical, but he linked it to our love for people horizontally, he linked our love for God vertically. It's between me and God. No, no, no. God's, Jesus says it's between you and his people as well. And so Jesus says eternal life isn't something that happens just after we die. No, he links our responsibility, if we're going to follow him, to bring heaven to earth. Heaven to earth, right? And so, so it's about knowing Jesus and trusting Jesus and following Jesus in, in this life. And so that meant that loving people, uh, that meant loving people. So imagine a world where uh, the people that we work with or people in our family or maybe even the people who hate Christians, they're skeptical of what you and I believe, but, but they're envious of how well you and I would treat one another. And Jesus says, hey, if you're going to follow me, you, you're going to need to love your neighbor as yourself. And the religious leader had never heard that before. It had never been linked that way. Uh, and so, so they were stumped. Now, remember, we're reading the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There are four different perspectives of the life of Jesus. So all of that had already happened. And so Luke gives us this insight in Luke chapter 10, that the religious leaders had already experienced all of that before. And so now they're coming back to Jesus and they have a plan. So they're going to debate Jesus about eternal life. And the expert of the law quotes Jesus' answer back to Jesus. He, he uses the Old Testament. So Luke 10, this is what he says. You must love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, and all your strength, and all of your mind, right? And then, then he adds Jesus's part. And love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, right, do this, and you will live. Conversation over. Jesus turns to walk away, but that was a setup for what he was gonna ask next. The man who wanted to justify his actions. So he asked Jesus, here's the trap. Here's the qualifier. Here's the turn. Who is my neighbor? So since our, your last teaching, Jesus, you told me to truly love God. I have to love my neighbor, but I'm overwhelmed by all of my neighbors. I'm overwhelmed by all of the need in the world. I, I can't, you can't expe possibly expect me to love everybody, Jesus. So Jesus, who, who is my neighbor? Now, the Hebrew word they used for neighbor was this word, rahe, rahe, right? And, and, and so that was, you can find that word in the Old Testament law, and it would suggest that when they thought of neighbor, they thought of friend, companion, or brother. But that does not jive with the way Jesus was using the term neighbor. Jesus was way too inclusive. And so when he, he goes to, to Jesus, he, he's trying to limit who is my neighbor. In other words, here's his real question. What is the minimum amount of neighbor loving required in order to get God's favor? Right? That's what I think too. What's the minimum amount of neighbor loving required in order to get God's favor? Jesus, I'm okay with caring for people who talk like me, think like me, act like me, vote like me. I'm okay with caring for the, even the people in my family, even though they're crazy, but I'm overwhelmed by all of the need out there in the world. And if you listen to Jesus, you, know, like you just say, hey, Jesus, I, I've listened to you. I have too many neighbors. So I don't want my lack of care for these people here to affect my standing with God here. 
So what is the minimum amount of neighbor loving I've got to do? How can I make sure I give God what he wants, but I don't miss out on what I want? Jesus, who is my neighbor? Now, um, for the last few years, we've been using this book to better understand who is our neighbor. It's a resource that we've used in the past, and it's called Bless, and it's a concept that we really do want to be a part of the DNA of our church. In fact, in the past, we gave you this neighborhood chart where you could go around and, and it's, it's in your app and it's in your notes. It's even out there on the, on the tables out there where you could list your neighbors. Maybe the people, uh, I mean, just the people in your neighborhood, right? And, and some of you have done this before and you told me, hey, Josh, this is great, but my neighborhood does not look like a tic-tac-toe board. And so you Google Earth your eight closest neighbors and you got on your Mr. Carter or Mr. Rogers cardigan and you walked around your neighborhood to spy on, I mean, uh, find out who your neighbors were. And, and, and so uh, you're learning your neighbors and we started this way back in 2021. And since then, uh, some of my neighbors have changed. So some of your neighbors might have changed and it might be time to reinvestigate who is your neighbor, or it, it could be time to, to expand your neighbor loving. So, so Jesus links, why do we do this? He links how we treat people horizontally with how we love God vertically. And so here's my question. It's an annoying question. Do you love your neighbor? <clears throat> do you even know who your neighbors are? So as we head towards Easter, what I want to do is create opportunities for you to invite your neighbor to Easter at Victory. <coughs> We have these special invite cards under the seat back of the chair in front of you. And we've been planning the Easter service for a couple months now. And, and, and I know that some of you are going to go through a dark time. And you know some people who are going through a dark time. We want you to invite them. But before you invite them, this is important. Before you invite them, we want you to invest in them. They're not a project. Before you invite them, we want you to invest in them and be intentional about this command of Jesus. And for those of you who've been with us more than a couple of years, uh, do, you, do, do you might remember what BLESS stands for? I'll just go through it real quickly for you. The, the B means begin with prayer. So as you're enjoying the spring, the weather, you know, you're out there on a walk or you're driving by in this next month as a church, I want you to pray specifically for your neighbors by name. All right, that's important, by name. Do you know the names of your neighbors? Let's not like God help lawn guy. You know, God, please help the trash can family to pick up their trash. Like, like that's, that's not the kind of prayer that we're talking about. So for the next month, we're, we're going to be praying for our neighbors by name. The second is simply this, to, to listen. So often we try to think about to respond. We want you to listen. You know, some, sometime in the next month, you're going to maybe strike up a conversation with a neighbor and you're not trying to respond. The whole purpose is to listen and learn about your neighbor. And we want to listen to people's stories. So the L is for listen. The E is my favorite. Uh, it's something that you might be an expert in. It's, it's eat. Right? And for the next month, I, I want you to make a plan to at least have one meal with one of your neighbors. Because why? Because there's something about sharing a meal together that can move any relationship, a past acquaintance towards friendship. The first S is, is serve. So here's, here's what will happen. I'm convinced if you're praying for your neighbor and you're listening to your neighbor and you've eaten with your neighbor, that you'll find a way to best serve your neighbor. And the last one is, is to share your story. So when you bless others, here's what will happen. There will come a time, there will be an opportunity where someone will say, hey, what you're doing is different. What makes you different? Why are you doing this? And you will have the opportunity to share your story about the life-changing love of Jesus. We want people to know that they're not a project, but we're doing this because of Jesus. And if you need help crafting your story, we have it on our website. It's also in your, in your app under resources. It's called Share Your Story. So just go there and it'll get you started and we'll take you through the rest. So, so for the next month, we wanna focus on blessing our, our neighbors. And, and if any of those steps overwhelm you, if you're thinking, yeah, I'll do the first one and I like to eat, so I'll do that. If there's any kind of pushback on any of that, I don't want to do all of that. Get this, that's exactly how the religious leader felt. Whenever we are overwhelmed by all of the need in the world, what we all try to do is we try to limit our neighbor loving. So we think, hey, Jesus, can it just be like the two houses over here? Because I tried loving these people over here and Mr. Rogers did not adequately prepare me for my crazy neighbors, right? So, so you're, you're like the religious leaders ask Jesus, hey, let's be specific, Jesus, who is my neighbor? 
And whenever we try to limit who you and I bless, Jesus will interrupt our regularly scheduled plans. In fact, what he does next in this context is he delivers a parable that even if you've never been to church before, you've probably heard this teaching from Jesus before about what to do when you and I are overwhelmed by all of the need in the world. And it starts off this way. It says, a Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho. So Jesus says, hey, there's this man, there's this sojourner, there's this traveler in the world, and he is traveling down from Jerusalem to Jericho. So it's a steep descent. That's a picture of the real life elevation there today. So in Jesus's parable, he's describing a real life highway in Jesus's day. Here's a picture of it. And guess what its nickname is? The way of blood. It is rockery, rocky, it's treacherous, right? It's going down from Jerusalem down to Jericho. I mean, can you imagine being in the first century and go, pack up the kids or pack up the donkey kids. We're headed to the way of blood. It's gonna be awesome. Like, no, it's just crazy to think about. But, but it was called that because this stretch of road was known for people getting robbed and beat up and raped and even murdered. In fact, the Jewish historian Josephus accused us in that not only was Jesus confronting their concept of neighbor, that Jesus is actually addressing a racial dynamic that was going on in their culture. In fact, Josephus says this way, the Samaritans killed a great many Galileans or, or Jews who were en route to Jerusalem. So the story that Jesus made up, the story that Jesus is telling is not hypothetical. He's actually addressing their real life experience. And so when Jesus said, hey, a Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, he was, he was attacked by bandits. Here's what they were thinking. It was probably a Samaritan that attacked him. That, that's probably who, who beat him up. And so they stripped him of his clothes and they beat him up and they left him half dead beside the road. And so what we have is Jesus is telling the stories. There's this traveler there's this adventurer, there's this person living life and exploring the world and all of a sudden, life has left them smack dead. Life has left them half dead on the side of the road. Have you ever felt that way? Alive on the outside, but dead on the inside. Does that resonate with anyone else here today? Like when was the last time you were living life but your soul was worn out? Your soul is burnt out. You can't handle any more bad news. You can't handle any more setbacks. If you've ever felt alive physically, but dead spiritually, by definition, you have felt half dead. And Jesus tells us this parable that there's this man attacked by life, half dead on the side of the road. And by chance, a, a priest came along. So uh, the priest would have represented God, right? So the priest sees the man dying, right? This, the, this person of God. But when he saw the man lying there, he just went to the other side of the road and passed him by, right? And check this out. A temple assistant walked over and looked at him lying there, but he also passed by on the other side. And so like you have this uh, person, you know, who, who makes God a priority. They, they help out in the temple, right? They, but they walk over and look at the guy and go, I'm gonna keep on moving. Now, the reason that the Jewish religious leaders did this is they believed in something that Jesus followers don't believe in. Jesus followers do not believe in karma, but they did. They, they believe what goes around comes around. They thought that this guy deserved it. So they thought, hey, if there's this guy broken and bleeding and bruised on the side of the road, half dead, he did something to deserve to be half dead on the side of the road. So I'm not gonna help get out, go out of my way to help him because God gave him what he deserves. That's what they thought. So Jesus, he, he keeps on teaching. And what he says next is so offensive to the people listening that day. He says, then a despised Samaritan, you know, came along and he saw the man and he felt compassion for him. To which the, the expert of the law would be like, oh, Jesus, you're making up the story. Can we change the story? This is a terrible story. Because the best way to describe the tension that was actually felt between Jews and Samaritans was institutionalized racism. Jews wouldn't have anything to do with Samaritans. They wouldn't speak to them. They definitely wouldn't touch them. And Jesus makes this despised Samaritan the hero of his made up story. And then check this out. He, puts the, put on, put the, he put the man on his own donkey and he took him to the inn where he took care of him. And the next day he handed the innkeeper two silver coins. So the Samaritan bandaged him up and puts him on his donkey. And for some reason, Jesus wants us to know that the Samaritan that was half dead, Jesus takes him, or the Samaritan takes him to the inn. And he stays there with him to care for him. 
And then he leaves two days wages. And he says, hey, take care of this man. If his bill runs higher than, than this, I'll pay you in the next time I'm here. Now, I want you to see the genius of Jesus. Because in this parable that Jesus made up, the Jewish lawyer is trying to stump Jesus. But, but like in this parable, who is he? In the story that Jesus made up, he's not the Samaritan. Who, who is he? He's the man that was beaten on the side of the road. He puts himself as, as that, puts that guy as that way. And you probably never thought about it like this, but I would like to suggest to you that Jesus cast himself as the Samaritan. That the Samaritan was rejected by the Jews. Well, what was said of Jesus? He was rejected by his own. And so here comes this rejected Samaritan, right? Who, who we think is Jesus. And he sees a man beaten up by life, half dead by life. And so what does Jesus do? He moves towards the mess. He moves towards the pain. He comes down off of his animal. He comes down. Sound familiar? He comes down. And he starts bandaging up the wounds of the half dead man and healing the half dead man. And where does he place the half dead man? Back on his donkey, right? Where he was. And so now the man is seated where Jesus, the Samaritan was. And the Samaritan has taken the place of where the half dead man was. And all of a sudden you're like, mind grenade. He's, do, he's preaching the gospel. He's preaching the gospel to these people and he shows them what it looks like to love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus shows us what it looks like to, to bless our neighbor. Now, now before you think I'm, I'm asking you, hey, I want you to go do this. So, so I want you to get on, get, get a suit and go two by two and start knocking on doors, looking for hurting people. That's not what I'm asking, right? I want you to be clear that when Jesus told us this parable, the Samaritan didn't try to convert the Jewish man. See, when you try to convert somebody, they're a project. But a convert is to, to cause and adapt, uh, to adapt a different religion, political doctrine, opinion, et cetera. And so nowhere in the text does it say that the Samaritan converted the Jewish man. No, nowhere. No, no, Jesus, as a Samaritan, what did he do? He simply blessed him to enact good of any kind, right? They're not a project. So we're not trying to convert them. The Holy Spirit can do that. We're trying to bless them. Our goal is to bless them, not convert them. To bless them, not convert them. I'm asking you to bless them, the people around you. So the goal is, isn't just to convert them. Now the goal is to love people well and to bless them. And they will know that you're doing it. Why? Because you follow Jesus. And so we see Jesus, he blesses this man. And I want you to check out how Jesus ends the story. So the religious lawyer who tried to trap Jesus in his words now finds himself trapped. He turns, Jesus turns to the expert of the law and traps him with this. Now, which of these three would you say was his neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits? And I love this. Jesus says, forces him, you know, you say his name. <laughs> he says, the, the one, right, the one. So he's so mad, he can't even say Samaritan. The one who showed him mercy. And then Jesus just might drops on him. He says, well, yeah, now go and do the same. That's what it looks like. Yeah, you just go and do the same. It's classic Jesus. Hey, that was really difficult. Just go and live like that. And so the religious lawyer who was overwhelmed by all of the need in the world, he's trying to limit which neighbor he has to bless. And Jesus opens it up, not just to his neighborhood, Right, not just to the people on his block and not just to the people at his work and not just people, people at his school and not to the people on the baseball fields or the soccer fields. Jesus opens up this concept of neighbor loving to include anyone and everyone. In fact, if, if you've done your neighborhood, you've already got this covered, might, it may be time to go to work or school or someplace else. Our neighbor loving should include anyone and everyone. But one of the things that Jesus adds to this account, that if you step back and examine the account, it really doesn't make sense. It's the part that we normally skip over. And so my question uh, for all of that is simply this. Why did Jesus include the end in this parable? Like what, what's going on with, with the end? Why would he include that? In verse 34, he says, he put the man on his donkey and took him to an inn where he took care of him. And I'm like, I read that and it's like, he could have made his point without re talking about the end, right? If this whole thing was simply about blessing your neighbor, he, does, he could have done all of that without including that part. So, so why does Jesus include the end? And I would just like to suggest to you that I believe that Jesus is hinting at his church, the church he, he promised to build to bless people. 
That in this parable, after Jesus takes the guy, he takes him to the inn, he's saying that his church is supposed to be like this inn. It's supposed to be a place where people are, who are going through hell can heal. A church should be a place where people who are half dead can come here and find new life. It's the, it says the Samaritan picked him up and took him to the inn, to which we're like, we're like Jesus, like, why did you take him to an inn? Why didn't you just take him home? Well, home would have been heaven. And this guy's half dead. He's going through hell. He wasn't prepared for home. His life wasn't ready for, for heaven. So Jesus drops him off at his church. And Jesus says to his followers, Jesus says to his church, my church should be a beacon of hope in the middle of pain, not removed from the pain. That Jesus says our church should be more like an emergency room than a country club. And we shouldn't be surprised if hurt people come to our church. We need to be ready to move towards broken people who come through our doors. And I, I mean, we need to head towards the pain. And I don't know about you, but I don't like pain. I would rather avoid pain altogether. I mean, some of you are crazy. You're like, Josh, no pain, no gain. I like Advil. <laughs> I don't prefer pain. And so when, when we consider who our hero is, you have to know that Jesus did not avoid pain. Jesus' very presence in our world is an exercise and moving towards the pain. In fact, scripture says this, that the church is his body, which means what is true of Jesus personally should be true of us collectively. If we're really his body, if you and I are the, the body of Jesus, we should act and look like what, how Jesus act. We need to be the kind of church that actually moves towards the, the pain. And so where in your neighborhood is there pain? Where is it dark? Where is it bleak? Where are people hurting? I wonder if God would send you there. To which you might say, Josh, like, are you talking about like planting little churches all over these neighborhoods? Are you talking about like maybe building a location? No, hear me. You and I are walking, talking locations. The church was never about a building. It's always been about a people. We don't go to church. We are the church everywhere we go. And everywhere we go, we are called to move toward the pain, not run from it. In fact, the, the first words the Samaritan to the innkeeper was simply this, take care of this man. Take, take care of him. I don't know how you read it, but it hits me like a ton of bricks, right? Because I like to argue with Jesus, but Jesus commands us to care. Because like, he says, take care of him. And I'm like, hey, no, Jesus, what's his backstory? Doesn't matter. Take care of him. How did he get this way? It doesn't matter. Take care of him. Well, what's his background? Doesn't matter. Take care of him. Well, what does he believe? It doesn't matter. Take care of him. But how does he vote? It doesn't matter. Take care of him. Do you see any distinction? Do you see any definition? Jesus never said, hey, don't worry. He didn't do this to himself. He was attacked by others. No, Jesus commands us to care. But Jesus, he's a drug user. I don't care. Take care of him. He's an embezzler. I don't care. Take care of him. Jesus, are you saying that we're just, you're trying to tell me that we should just take care of anybody who comes through those doors? Jesus would say, yeah, I'm commanding you to care. So that's why at Victory, we reserve the right to care for anyone and everyone. Anyone and everyone, because Jesus commands us to care. In fact, I, I wonder if you and I are actually living the way Jesus called us to live, if you and I are not being criticized like Jesus. I mean, do you remember how that they criticized Jesus in Luke 15? The religious people complained that Jesus was hanging out with sinners. He accepts them. He befriends them. We think he condones them. That's what was said of Jesus. Now, I want to make a distinction. There's a difference between acceptance and approval. There's a difference between acceptance and, and approval. But as you are overwhelmed by all of the need in the world, let me ask you one last offensive question. Who have you excused yourself from caring about? Who is it for you? Well, what kind of people do you excuse yourself from caring about? Well, Josh, they got themselves into this mess. Well, I, I'm not saying you approve, but, but do you care? Do they feel accepted by you? Will they be blessed by you? Who have you excused yourself from, from caring about? So Jesus is teaching that all God's children, red, brown, yellow, black, and white, were all precious in his sight. I mean, can, can you imagine if you came up to me after church and said, hey, Josh, I love you. You're great. You're a great teacher. I, I think you care about the church, right? I love your family. Like you have an amazing family. Your wife's amazing. Your kids are fantastic, except uh, the youngest guy. Except for Carter, right? We don't like him at all. 
There's something wrong with that kid. Josh, just keeping it real. But I love you. You're great. But Carter, eh, I promise you, I would put the smack down in Jesus' name in your direction, right? Right? I'll, after I ask you for forgiveness, and I will choose to love you because I have to, because I'm supposed to love everybody. But I'm, like, I'm just telling you what would happen because what we try to do is we excuse people, from, we excuse ourselves from caring. Because here's what we do. God, I love you. I just don't like your kids. I love singing to you. I love reading your books. I love highlighting stuff you said. You're a good, good father. God, I love you, but I just don't like that kid over there. And see, you made a mistake over there. And we think that God will agree with us. We think that our heavenly father's like, yeah, you're right. No, they're all God's children. We're all his kids. In the kingdom of God, you need to hear this. There are no good kids and bad kids. There are lost kids and found kids. In the kingdom of God, there are no good kids and bad kids. There are lost kids and found kids. And so who of you excuse yourself from caring about? I mean, can we be the kind of church that is courageous enough to remove, get rid of, reject the idea that some people can be overlooked and some people can be ignored and some people can just not be loved because that is not the heart of the father. No, the heart of the father, he commands us to care. In fact, the night before the cross, Jesus gathers his disciples to, together. He says, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. What I do, I just wanna die for you. So you must love one another. Will we be the church that cares? Can we be a church that blesses people? They'll take steps towards loving our neighbor. And I know it's gonna get messy and you don't have all of the answers and they might not have taught you that in Bible college. But just so you know, Jesus never commanded any of us to be annoying know-it-alls. He, he didn't, right? He says, I want you to, to bless my people. I want, I want you to care about my people. I want you to love one another. Now, now, maybe you're here today and you aren't a Jesus follower and life has left you beaten up and bruised and broken down. I just want you to know you're not alone. At one point, that was all our story. And you came to the right place to heal. God's not scared of your mess. Get this, he knows about your mess and he loves you anyway. And you might be thinking, Josh, you never answered the question. Well, what do I do when I'm overwhelmed by all of the need in the world? Well, I just wanna point you to the words of Jesus. He closes out the parable. He says, now, which of these three would you say was the neighbor? It's clear from the text, it was the one who saw a need and met it. The one who knew the price and paid it. The one who didn't talk themselves out of it. That was the neighbor. And then telling you, the genius of Jesus is he always reverses the question. When he, you and I say, hey, we're overwhelmed, this is what Jesus says, don't think about uh, who they are, but who you are. So the point isn't about limiting our neighbor loving ability. The point isn't about you and I doing the bare minimum. The point isn't being careful not to condone their sin. The point is about you and I blessing people because you and I are the children of God. You and I are the body of Christ. So don't think about who they are, but who you are. And so as you bless your neighbor, remember, Jesus says, hey, the true neighbor is simply this, the one who saw a need and met it, the one who knew the price and paid it, and the one who didn't talk themselves out of it. And I believe that Jesus would say to us what he said to that religious leader that day. It's now go and do the same. Just go and do the same. There's so much need, there's so much hurt. Don't worry about all that. Just go and do the same. Would you bless your neighbor? Would you pray with me? Father, I just thank you so much for rescuing us. And so much, I just, Father, I want to admit that I, I am like the lawyer who tries to limit what I do for you or what I do for others. But Father, I just pray that you keep our hands open as a congregation to whatever it is you want to do through us Father, I pray for a whole bunch of people this week that, that they will see a need and that they will meet it. They will find out a price and pay it and they quit talking themselves out of it. Father, I am so thankful you didn't talk yourself out of sending your son to die for me. So Father, may we turn around and do that for the people around us. It's in Jesus' name I pray. 
Thank you so much for joining us for Victory On Demand. Here at Victory, we believe that we all have a next step, and we pray that God uses what you've experienced here today to stir something in your life and to lead you to the next step in your faith journey, whatever that may be. If you'd like to talk to someone about taking your next step, please let us know by clicking the button that's popping up on your screen right now. Here at Victory, we're contributors, not just consumers, and we consider it a privilege to give back what God has so freely given to us. We celebrate generosity in the work that God does through our sacrificial giving in our community and around the world. If your experience today has helped you or blessed you in any way, we invite you to partner with us financially in our vision of connecting people back to God by going to victorycc.live slash give. Again, if you haven't experienced a live victory service yet, we invite you to visit victorycc.life for more information on when and where you can join us in person or online. Remember, here at Victory, we don't just go to church. We are the church everywhere we go. We'll see you next time.